the book of Galatians, chapter 3 and verse number 1. O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you that ye should not obey the truth, before whose eyes Jesus Christ had been evidently set forth, crucified among you? Hmm? Paul could not believe that they had allowed the Judaizers to change their beliefs concerning the gospel of Jesus Christ. All right, let's look at verses 2 through 4. This only would I learn of you. Receive ye the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Are ye so foolish? Having begun in the Spirit, are ye now made perfect by the flesh? Have ye suffered so many things in vain? If it be yet in vain? Now, Paul raises several questions here in this passage. Number one, how did you receive the Holy Spirit? Was it by the works of the law or was it by the hearing of faith? Number two, after you have received the indwelling of the Holy Spirit by faith, are you now made perfect, justified, or complete by the flesh, by your works? Number three, are you going to let all of the things you have suffered come to naught, to nothing? He reminded them with that question of how they had paid a price for receiving the gospel of Jesus Christ. Their lives were constantly in danger because of their faith. Paul says, after all you have gone through for the gospel's sake, are you going to throw it all away for the law which cannot save you? Absolutely not. Then he poses a fourth question. Look at verse 5 and 6. He says, he therefore that ministered to you the spirit and worked miracles among you, Doing he it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Hmm? Even as Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Now, the Apostle Paul was a wise defender of the truth. He uses a perfect illustration of justification by faith. Abraham is the great illustration of justification by faith. Paul used him as an example in both the Roman and Galatian epistles. Why? Because it cannot be said that Abraham was justified by the law because the Mosaic law was not given until 430 years after Abraham. All right, let's look at verses 7 and 8. Know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. Now, God did this for Abraham before the law was ever given. God did not make the covenant with Abraham because of his good works, but because he believed God. The scripture foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith preached before the gospel unto Abraham. If faith without works was sufficient for Abraham, why should we desire something different? And as the blessing was not for Abraham's law works, but for his faith, why should we turn from faith to law works? Hallelujah. Look at verse 9. So then they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. Oh, I like that. Listen, the word faithful in this verse is believing Abraham. God saves sinners today on the same basis that he saved Abraham, and that is by faith. All right, let's look at verses 10 and 11. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse, for it is written, Curse is every one that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. But that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God, it is evident, for the just shall live by faith. Now, everyone who continue it in the law is accursed. Why? Because it is impossible for an individual to keep the law without breaking at least one of them. It is evident that no one can be justified by the law in the sight of God. Habakkuk chapter, chapter 2 and verse 4 says, The just shall live by his faith. The Old Testament taught that man was saved by faith. You will never find anywhere in Scripture of a person being saved by keeping the law. All right, let's look at verses 12 through 14. And the law is not of faith, but the man that doeth them shall live in them. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Curse is every one that hangeth on a tree. 
that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Now, Israel had the law for 1,500 years and failed to live by it. At the Council of Jerusalem in Acts chapter 15, Peter said, We and our fathers were not able to keep the law. Why do we want to put the Gentiles under it? If we couldn't keep it, they won't be able to keep it either. Jesus Christ took our place that we might receive what the law could never give us, and that is the promise of the Holy Spirit. All right, let's look at verses 15 and 16. Brethren, I speak after the manner of men, though it be but a man's covenant, yet if it be confirmed, no man disannul it or add it thereto. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He said not, and to seize as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed which is Christ. Now, God called Abraham and promised to make him a blessing to the world. He made him a blessing to the world through Jesus Christ, a descendant of Abraham. Christ is the one who brought salvation to the world. Now, the word seed refers specifically to, to Jesus Christ. In Genesis chapter 22 and verse 18, we read, And in thy seed... Singular, not plural. In, and in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because thou has obeyed my voice. Now, Jesus Christ is the seed spoken of here. Jesus said this in John's gospel, chapter 8, verses 56. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. All right, let's look at verses 17 through 19. And this I say that the covenant that was confirmed before of God in Christ, the law which was 430 years after, cannot disannul that it should make the promise of none effect. For if the inheritance be of the law, it is no more of promise, but God gave it to Abraham by promise. Wherefore, then serve it the law. It was added because of transgressions till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. And it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. Listen, God made a promise, a covenant with Abraham. When the law came along 430 years later, it didn't change God's covenant or promise made to Abraham. The promise concerning Abraham's seed, which is Jesus Christ, was made before the Mosaic law was given. Nothing, including the law, could change that. All the promises of God are yea and amen. Then Paul poses a question. Wherefore then serve it the law? What was the purpose of the law? Paul says it was added because or for the sake of transgressions till the seed, which is Jesus Christ, should come. This tells us that the law was temporal. It was given for the interval between the time of Moses until the time of Jesus Christ. John's Gospel, chapter 1 and verse 17 reads, For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Oh, glory to God. All right, let's look at verses 20 through 24. Now, a mediator is not a mediator of one, but God is one. Is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid. For if there had been a law given which could have given life, verily righteousness should have been by the law. But the scripture had concluded all under sin that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. But before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up unto the faith which should afterwards be revealed. Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ that we might be justified by faith. Here Paul poses another question. Is the law then against the promises of God? Absolutely not. If God would have given a law by which sinners could be saved, then righteousness would have been by the law. But he chose another route, and that is through his son, Jesus Christ. But the law brought debt. Ezekiel chapter 18 and verse 20 says, The soul that sinned it, it shall die. The scripture had concluded all under sin. For what purpose? That the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them who believe. Now Paul goes on to say that before faith came, they were kept under the law. Again, Paul shows that the law was only temporary until Jesus would come. He says that the law was our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ in order for us to be justified by faith. Romans chapter 4 and verse 5 tells us, But to him 
that work it not, but believe it on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Listen, God refused to accept the works of man for salvation. God says that all of our righteousness are as filthy rags. The law was not given to, to, to save sinners, but to let them know that they were indeed sinners. The law does not remove sin. It reveals sin. The law does not remove sin. No, it reveals sin. All right, let's look at verses 25 and 26. But after that fate has come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. Now, the word schoolmaster here means something different than what it means today. It meant a servant or a slave who was a part of a Roman household. In the home of a patrician, a member of the Patriotorian Guard, or the rich in the Roman Empire, were slaves that cared for the children. When a child was born into such a home, he was put in the custody of a servant or a slave who actually raised him. He would put clean clothes on him, bathe him, and uh, feed him, and so on. When the little one grew to a certain age and was to start school, this servant was the one who got him up in the morning, dressed him, and took him to school. That is where he got the name of schoolmaster. The Greek word for schoolmaster is P-A-I-D-A-G-O-G-O-S. Paid has to do with the feet, and we get our word pedal from it. Agagos means to lead. It means that he takes the little one by the hand, leads him to school, and turns him over to the school teacher. This servant or slave was not capable of teaching him beyond a certain age, so he took him to school. Now, what Paul is saying here is that the law is our paid agagos. The purpose of the law was to lead or bring men to Christ. How? It revealed to man that he was indeed a sinner in need of a savior. Then he says that we are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. All right, let's look at verse 27. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Now, the baptism of the Holy Spirit places you in the body of believers. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 13 reads, For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be born or free. And have been all made to drink into one spirit. Listen, God sees us in Christ. Therefore, he sees us as perfect. All right. Let's look at verse 28. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For ye are all one in Christ Jesus. Now, God is not a respecter of persons. We are all equal in his eyes. We have all been made one in Christ Jesus. He does not see gender or status. Jesus brought about equality. Glory to God. He brought about equality in his body. All right, let's look at verse number 29. And if ye be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Now, how are we Abraham's seed? Abraham's seed is Jesus Christ. We belong to Jesus Christ and are heirs according to the promise. 